welcome everybody and thank you for joining us uh, in this PCI e-course and the title of the session is called post RV PCI Access Overcoming the Challenges. Uh, it's me Ganesh Mala from Belfast and I'm co-chairing this with uh, Flavio Ribicini from uh, Verona uh, in Italy. And the objective of the session is to discuss procedural tips and tricks to achieve PCI access after TAVI valve implantation and to demonstrate uh, practical post TAVI PCI access using excellent case examples from Flavio. These are our disclosures. So the incidence of ischemic heart disease in TAVI patients is wide, but generally in the range of between 50 to 60%, depending on the type of studies you look at. And they generally tend to follow the STS score or the risk of the patient. However, remember in the moderate low risk patients, they may develop ischemic heart disease at a later stage. So trying to access the coronary arteries post TAVI is important. The incidence of uh, post tavi PCI is rated between 1.9 to 5.7%, depending on the studies you look at. And reassuring the success rate has been fairly high. And these are some of them are historical data, but ranging between 91% to about 100%. And I guess the variation could be due to the experience of the operator and whether you've actively tried to engage coronary arteries, uh, even if you do not need to. Now, in the cath lab, uh, what are the technologies do you need to be able to access coronary arteries safely? You do need a range of guide catheters, and I've shown you some examples here between JL3.5 to an EBU, a range of PCI wires, including floppy wires and CTO, uh, <coughs> sorry, floppy wire, I'll redo the slide again. So what equipment do you need in a cath lab? Uh, you do need a range of guide catheters between JL3.5 and EBU, a range of PCI wires, both floppy wires and uh, hydrophilic wires, and occasionally CTO wires as well, a range of PTCA, PTCA balloons, including low profile CTO balloons, a range of stents, micro catheters, extension catheters like Guideliner, for example, and a snare. Excess can be challenging in some of these patients. So, if you are new to this, I would suggest using a transfemoral approach or a left radial approach, uh, initially, especially the horizontal anatomy and a short ascending aorta. Um, and remember, you can always do an aerogram before you start engaging the vessel uh, and the uh, frame, just to have an idea on where the coronary takeoffs are. And remember, if the TAVI is recent, this could be due to thrombus in the aortic root. And if you have difficulty engaging the coronary artery, these may be due to a very short SCJ, small SV, bulky old leaflets, especially calcification of the leaflet tips, or the TAVI commissure is sitting uh, right in front of the coronary arteries. Just to summarize then, JL4, JR4 uh, catheters frequently used. Use six French rather than seven French. Try to get to a frame coaxial to the coronary artery. Uh, be free to use extension catheters. And then remember before you uh, disengage your guide uh, to uh, use the wire uh, before disengaging your guide. This is just an example, a diagram showing what we were going to show in the live case. Um, the frame of the Evolute um, is, has a waist on it and the waist helps positioning the guide because it uh, creates space between the coronary ostia and the frame. Uh, it's about 10 French in size. And remember also that the frame of the core valve of the Evolute also is quite supportive once the guide is in position. And you can remember always, you can use the extension catheter I've just mentioned to give you better support when you're trying to advance uh, catheters or stents uh, through the uh, coronary artery. There are, of course, many areas where it could be challenging to access coronary arteries. I've just given you three different scenarios. We will visit this in the live case, in the cases. One is the uh, low coronary ostia. The second one is where you have the frame or the commercial of the, of the frame sitting right in front of the coronary artery. And the third one is when you have a valve in valve scenario. And you can see from on the uh, pictures I've just shown you, there's a lot of frame to go through. And you sometimes could have not only the frame, but also the commercials of the, of the valve uh, sitting in front of the uh, coronary ostia. And once again, remember, before taking the wire, disengage the guide uh, and then take the wire out. Otherwise, you could be in trouble. Now with that, Flavio, um, why don't you show us some of your excellent cases that actually illustrates uh, all what we have discussed so far. Flavio. 
Thank you, Ganesh. Thank you very much for this opportunity of sharing our experience with this uh, fascinating issue. And thank you, Medtronic, for making me playing a, a role in this, in this topic. I will go straight forward to the cases that you have uh, already anticipated because I want to be very practical in the message to our colleagues. This is a case done, as you can see, seven years ago. It's a typical high-risk heavy patients of that time who was also symptomatic for angina, which, as you know, is not the most common symptom of uh, uh, aortic stenosis. You can see at the CT scan the huge calcification of both the valve, the mitral aortic junction, mitral aortic junction, and the origin of the coronary arteries. And uh, this is uh, a case of, let's say, normal coronary takeoff. But what you find here is the massive calcification of the aortic osteal part of the right coronary artery. Uh, at that time, we used the Oracle valve. You see that the implantation is the regular height, maybe a little bit lower than what we would do today. But actually, that, that was a good, a good idea because as you know, the higher you go, the more part of the tissue of the valve will be exposed to the osseo of the corners. Uh, this is a um, non-selective angiography of the right coronary artery using a regular Jatkins for right coronary guiding catheter. Uh, one of my messages is not, uh, it, it's to say that you don't need to be perfectly selective to work on the corners. And in a case like this with a very tight osteal stenosis, maybe it's a good thing not to be occlusive with the guiding catheter into this big right coronary artery. What you see on the uh, left picture is this rapid traveling of a wire inside the right coronary artery. It's not that easy. Of course, this is a picture taken with the extra support rotor wire through a microcatheter. So the first thing was to cross with your preferred wire, in my case, the Pilot 50, then put a microcatheter, retrieve the Pilot and use the microcatheter as a rail to put your rotor wire. On the right side of the slide, you see a regular performance of a rotablation with a 1.5 bar in this bulky calcification of the right coronary artery. And then the rest is a regular procedure, balloon dilatation and easy drag eluding stent navigation through the struts of the valve and the stent positioning with this final result. Flavio, just a quick uh, question. So if you, if your standard wire to cross the frame is a Pilot 50, and if the Pilot yes. 50, if you have difficulty at Pilot 50, what is your uh, escalation of wire use? Well, you know, the first thing you, you need is to get access to the corner. So you try with the wire you feel more comfortable with. Pilot 50 is my favorite wire, but you may like other kinds of hydrophilic wires or non-hydrophilic wires. There is not magic wire. The good one is the, the, the one that gets distally into the artery. Okay. So any wire that you're comfortable with? Of course. Okay. Great. Of course. So this is a case of uh, that, that we have selected to show you, uh, let's say, a demanding PCI because it's a very calcified lesion with a normal origin of the right coronary artery after the implantation of an old core valve. Now we go to the left. This is again a high risk patient performed five years ago, admitted again for uh, symptoms of aortic stenosis and angina and a moderate dep depression of the LV function. The diagnostic angiogram was performed from the radial artery. And uh, you can see here a clear, severe stenosis of the left main, the shaft of the left main, with a lot of calcium, which is confirmed from the spider view and the caudal right oblique view. In case you have a, a doubt on the functional meaning of, of this lesion, you can easily perform your physiologic assessment. You can see that both the, F, the, the, the LED and the circumflex FFR measurements are severely impaired. And this is a nice picture to show you the technique to engage the coronary ostia 
through the core valve. This is coming from the femoral artery. This is an uh, extra backup 3.5. You keep your 0.35 inches wire inside. This gives you the opportunity of opening and closing the tip of your guiding catheter until you find the good diamond of the valve strut, which will uh, allow you to engage or at least to get close to the osseum of the left main. Very important that you keep your wire connector at the end of the guiding catheter so you don't have bleeding on the table while you try this and you retrieve the 0.35 wire only when you feel that you are in a good position. Then the rest, as I said before, it's a regular PCI. This is again a complex case with a lot of calcium on the left main. We decided to do a first uh, ablation with a 1.5 bar upgrading with a 1.75 and then predilation with a non-compliant balloon and the implantation of a resident onyx stent with a technique of uh, um, provisional stenting, single stent going from the left main to the LAD. And uh, then as you can see, easily crossing with the IVUS prop, with a guiding catheter through the, the, the core valve going to the LAD and doing your pullback with the IVUS and then going to the CERC to show the good expansion of the stent and the good uh, result at the osteum of the proximal CERC. So with the safety of this uh, provisional stenting. This is the final result. This gentleman had more than five years follow-up without symptoms and uh, events. Now, Flavio, a lot of people will look at the first two examples you've shown so far and say, why did you not stent the artery before putting the valve in? <laughs> yes. I, know, I know why you do it, but it'll be important for our colleagues to hear from you. Well, uh, this, of course, is a fascinating issue. Uh, we do believe that the main problem of these uh, old patients with aortic stenosis is the aortic stenosis itself. Most of the times what you find in the coronary arteries it's a, it's a um, uh, say, uh, occasional finding. In the two cases I've shown you, the two patients were symptomatic for angina, but most of them are not. We yeah. do believe that performing complex PCI in a patient with severe aortic stenosis and LV dysfunction, it's more risky than performing the same procedure after you have get rid of the aortic stenosis. And uh, you might, may be concerned about the difficulties of going through the core valve to do the procedure. I'm showing you that in our experience, this is not a problem. It may be more demanding, but it's not a problem. Perfect. Let's see your next case, Flavio. Well, this, this is an example of, again, massive calcification, high-risk patients, candidate for TAVI. And as you can see in this CT scan, a low origin of the right coronary artery, which might add some difficulties to the previous two cases. You can see at the coronary angiogram that indeed the origin of the right coronary artery is quite low. And again, in this case, you have this massive calcification, which is a little bit after it's paraosteal after the origin of the right coronary artery. Again, you might ask me, why don't you do the artery before? And I will tell you, because I want to show you that you can do this safely after you have implanted your valve. This case required a balloon predilatation because of this uh, amount of calcium. And you see the, I'd say, regular height of the implantation of the core valve. But after that, it was not so easy to get selectively into the right coronary artery. Again, one of my practical messages is not struggle to get selective in the artery. The first step is to see the relationship in between your guiding the valve and the origin of the artery. It's very important that you know exactly how your valve is done. You must know which is the structure of your valve, where there is tissue, the commissures, how it is done. And then, of course, next step is to get inside. As you can see, uh, in this case was difficult, but the first step is to get a guide wire inside. In this difficult case, we decided to use an extension catheter, which makes you get closer to the artery. And after that, you can put 
whatever wire you need, as in this case, it's a uh, rotor wire to perform rotational atherectomy, and then it's a regular procedure. You see how working with the warming of the catheter, with the pull and pushing movements, the guiding catheter is getting more and more selective, and you can implant your stent, post dilate, and get with this final result. And Flavio, the um, key message, I guess, is to be not too persistent about trying to engage your catheter, but keep the catheter around the same vicinity and then using a wire to engage the vessel and then do all the other necessary tips we have already discussed. Are the views you use to pick the right or left coronary arteries similar as you standardly use or would you need to change because there's a frame now sitting where it is? No, well, in, uh, that, that's a good point. It's not different to your regular practice. Of course, yeah. you need to try to be well aligned, coaxial to the artery, so you may need to change your view. But as, as you well pointed out, you don't need to waste too much, time, too much time and contrast wishing to get inside the artery. What you need to get, it's a wire inside. And then by physiologic movements and pulling and pushing, in some way you will slip into the, the right direction. Okay, let's uh, go to the next case, Flavio. Well, it's quite fascinating. Next case, what to do if the commissure happens to be in front of the coronary artery? Of course, this is a nightmare that we all have when we think on the structure of the valve. And this, of course, might be even worse, like in the case I will show you in, in a few seconds. This happens. Sometimes valves pop up and uh, you must implant a second one. And then uh, you, as, as you know, there is a lot of tissue in front of the coronary ostia. The first thing is, as you said at the beginning of your presentation, is to do uh, an angiogram. You can do it with a pigtail or like in this case, a non-selective injection. So you have a good relationship in between the valve that you must know well how it's done and the origin of the, of the corners. The second point, and I think I have said this several times, is try to get into the corner. You don't necessarily need to be selective. Take your favorite wire. I said already which is mine, but this is very personal and I don't want to give advices, but this is what happens. Once you are there and your wire goes distally into the vessel, slowly, very slowly, gently being coaxial, and in, in, at this point it's important that you check your, the position of your catheter in different incidences, you will get this position, which is in this case, selective. So at that point, you can do anything into these corners. I mean, that's a great example. This is a patient with two wild frames and a commercial in front of the coronary artery. And I think uh, uh, the, the example illustrates very nicely uh, how if you're methodical and take things step by step, uh, you can achieve uh, what most people will say very challenging. So Yes, if, if I can add, I mean, it's, it's a mental position. Never start a case like this thinking that you are not going to make it. I mean, this is obvious for all interventionists, but be very positive and start thinking that you will do it because in our experience, it may take time, but you always manage to get into the core valve to engage the corners. Perfect. So let's uh, conclude the session now, uh, Flavio. So thank you, Flavio. That's excellent uh, cases to demonstrate how um, even with difficult anatomies and scenarios, you can still very comfortably gain access. But of course, you have the experience. But I think it, whenever, whenever we talk about gaining access, coronary arteries, it's important to have the balance between the potential need to gain access versus the clear benefit the Evolute Supranular technology has with its low profile, resheathable, repositionable, and importantly, a world-leading hemodynamic performance, a very low PPM. And also we now have nearly eight years clinical data on this valve in clinical use. So um, I think it's a balance trying to decide what valve to choose between what is clearly now versus what potentially could happen later on. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude the session by these points, I think PCRP-TAVI 
may be necessary, but consider the risk benefit ratio. Um, ensure that all PCA equipment are available for all your target cases, be prepared. Train yourself by performing coronary angiogram after valve implantation in conservative case series. I think this is a very important point. What you do not want to do is try to do this in the acute setting. Um, certain anatomies that we've already demonstrated and shown, such as low coronary ostia, uh, aberrant takeover of coronary arteries or malaligned commissures can be challenging. But again, Flavio has shown some examples where by, being, uh, by persevering, by being patient and wiring the vessel first, you can get it. And finally, I think in our, both our experiences, uh, coronary angiography and PCI uh, with this Evolute, although can be demanding uh, compared to other shorter frame valves, but it's always possible uh, when you need to do it. Flavi, would you like to add anything else? I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I think these are very practical advices and I wish you all good luck with your next case. Excellent. Thank you very much and thank you for joining us. Good luck.